Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today, I'm honored to have my friend and colleague, Michael Frazier with us. He is the Executive Vice President and Deputy Director of External Affairs at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum here in New York City. Today, we're going to hear a little bit about the intersection of the museum and the private sector. And then we're also going to hear about Michael's stellar career journey one filled with all kinds of fun tales. I just, well, we'll get into it in a moment. We'll leave a little suspense there. Uh, Michael Frazier, welcome to The Caring Economy. Toby, it's so good to see you and thank you for having me. Uh, Michael, we met uh, a while back actually through ArtsCom, a uh, communications group that we both belong to made up of cultural leaders and communicators here in New York. Um, but then we went on to, thanks to you, I, I was introduced to the Bloomberg campaign and got to work on Mike's um, uh, presidential campaign. So we've had some fun times together already. Yeah, for sure. I was hoping you remember that because I, I I remember when I came for the first meeting, it was like, okay, here's my first meeting. Oh, by the way, I'm going to start this new thing yeah. uh, tomorrow or whatever it was. And I knew when, when you and I spoke and talked about similar things, not just about from the cultural perspective, mm -hmm. but what we cared about in the community and civic engagement. I, I had no doubt you would become involved. I, it was just a matter of when and how. And here we are all these years later. Um, so Michael, tell us a little bit, on the, on the caring economy, we like to talk to our listeners a little bit about one's career journey, how they got where they got. And in particular, I love to hear about, my audience likes to hear about the pivots that were made along the way. So I, I believe you're an Arkansas native. I know you went to school down there, but is that where you were born and raised? That's right. My uh, mother was actually born in Chicago. I have family there, and uh, they moved to Arkansas when she was a little girl. And I, and when I got older, I used to tell my mom, I was like, why did you do the reverse migration? I don't really understand. <laughs> so we're supposed to head north, not head south, but they had their own reason. Uh, but yes, I am a, a native of Arkansas, specifically Hot Springs National Park. That's right. I grew up on a national park. And that must have been so much fun. It was interesting. You know, it was uh, a friend of mine, Dave Hill, just wrote a book based on a uh, business there called The Vapors. Um, he did some stuff in the New York Times, too. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about this little enclave is that, you know, it was around 30,000 people, but would balloon by maybe like five or 8,000 people in the summer because it was a resort town, mm -hmm. but also it had a, um, a racetrack. So people would come there for gambling. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously we had uh, people would come to the bathhouse for the resorts and for the massages. And so it was, it was an interesting place to, to, to grow up. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so then you decided to stay in Arkansas and go on to undergraduate. And from there, you came to New York. How did you, how did you go from the Springs to the big city of New York? You know, I, when people talk about trajectory, it's a strange thing because it's not like you're this rocket ship and you have one point that you start with and then you make it to this other point. There's a lot of things that you go through. You know, when I was growing up there talking about the racetrack, I remember I would go there and, and work in the summer because they would pay you in cash, mm -hmm. right? And I would save that money. So I was saving that money to go to college. Um, my mother uh, raised two boys. I have a twin brother, Christopher. And uh, I was raising this money to go to college. And the reason they paid you in cash is because most of the workers would then take that money that they were paid and then go straight to the windows where they could gamble. I did not have that addiction. So I saved all my money, paid all my taxes. And I met a man, you know, when I was in high school, um, I had an affinity for art and my teacher, Linda Lyon, uh, rest in peace. She was really teasing this out of me. and. We would go to gallery walks in downtown uh, Hot Springs and I met a man named Patrick Oliver who had just opened a gallery called Images of Africa. I was probably going into my junior year and for whatever reason, Patrick who, is, who lives in Little Rock, Arkansas now, he's an author, took a chance on me and uh, hired me to help him uh, run the gallery. And it was, it was pretty interesting to be I don't know what, 17 years old, uh, being an African art dealer in uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, of all places. I met a lot of interesting people. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot about the things that we 
were selling and about our exhibitions that we did. It was a, it was a great experience. And from that, I, I, I knew to tell stories about things that I may not, that I know Toby at the time, I wasn't really familiar with, even though I had an appreciation for the culture, obviously, obviously given who I am, but I developed this storytelling muscle. And um, that would lead to me loving journalism. I always had an affinity for it, for writing and reporting and telling other people's stories, putting people in, in other folks' shoes. Yeah. And that would lead me to go to the University of Arkansas where I met someone who changed my life. His name was Gerald Jordan. He was a reporter for a long time at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mm -hmm. And he just, he just made me think that I could really change the world through reporting and the things that I was most interested in, uh, including anything with, involved with social justice, Mm -hmm. I could write about it and have some kind of impact. So he put that in me. I had it there. He tapped it. Uh, and you excelled at it. I saw when I was reading through your bio, I've known you now for a while, but I didn't realize one of the things we share in common is a Fulbright. So, um, yes. so you clearly excelled at your journalism studies. And, um, and then your first job out of school, where did you go? So this is a, so this was interesting. So I wanted to actually go back to my home. Of all the places that most reporters want to do, you want to go to the big city and try to get into some larger stories, a larger market. I did try and fail miserably, uh, applied several times to Newsday. And Walter Middlebrook at the time, uh, we're friends. Walter Middlebrook was a recruiter there. And uh, I, I never asked him why he never hired me. But anyway, years and years, <laughs> wanted to work for Newsday. Wanted to work for Newsday. Um, so when I graduated, I actually went and visited my hometown newspaper because I knew growing up there, there was some subjects that they didn't cover, some people who weren't re represented. And I knew that, you know, I had a perspective that could lend to the organization. So I mean, I walked in, saw all these faces in this room that did not look like me. But, you know, after talking to uh, the editor at the time, she said there was no place for me. And um you know, I was just getting ready to graduate. So I said, okay, I walked out the door and I accepted a job with the Associated Press, the largest news organization mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. so that was my first gig right out of um, college. I actually graduated, I believe it was May 18th. I went and visited the uh, Center Record Newsroom in Hot Springs. I think it was on the 19th. And then I accepted a job and started with the Associated Press Bureau on, I believe, May 21st. Mm -hmm. So I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I did not want to waste time. Wow, I love that. So your pivot wasn't that's it wasn't you know you didn't get Newsday, you didn't get your hometown paper, but you got AP, which is the most I would argue the most important wire to this day. That's right. But eventually, eventually, uh, after working at some uh, print uh, papers, small and large, covering politics, crime, I got a call from Newsday, <laughs> <laughs> and I was. I was so thrilled. I didn't know what to do. My editor at the time, his name was Bob Wigginson. And I know I'm saying a lot of names there. These are important people who influenced my life. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I got that call and I flew out here. I I did a ghost writing assignment, I think over the weekend before my wheels touched down. Um, when I was returning, they said, well, will you come and, and work for Newsday and, and lead our crime bureau? And I said, absolutely. I was on the next plane smoking. Wow. So. Uh Ladies and gentlemen, again today we have Michael Frazier, who is the head of external affairs at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum here in New York. We're going to take a break and come right back with Michael. So you went onto the crime desk at Newsday, Michael. That must have been riveting. At the time, I, you know, I didn't have any kids. I didn't have a wife and I didn't sleep, didn't matter to me. Uh, so it was a lot of work. And from that, I was first covering Nassau County and that would extend it to me working, uh, covering the five bur bur boroughs um, and even coming into the city, I think about three or four times a week. Uh -huh. So it was a lot of work, but it's extraordinary. And, and the thing about crime that I realized when I looked at, look at it, the epidemiology of crime is that it, it affected everyone, right? There was no specific, there are certain crimes that take hold in specific communities for specific reasons, mm -hmm. but none of us, None of us was immune to a crime happening to us. It was just based into a degree. So it was something that was interesting to me. And I started to look at patterns and why. And um, no, I just I had an interesting time there. I learned about a lot of people. The most difficult thing I could tell you, Toby, 
Sure. It's knocking on someone's door uh, who have maybe lost a relative or, uh, you know, have just been arrested for something. You want their side of the story no matter what. So I, I always approach it as here's someone who lost a loved one. Mm-hmm. Here's someone who was charged with that crime. I may feel a certain way about what happened, but I wanted to make sure that I have both sides. So not only the reader could understand it, but, 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 but me too as the reporter. Right, and that's the responsibility of a journalist. In, in this country, anyway, we're, we're supposed to be without uh, influencing in our coverage, our own points of views. So, so from Newsday, then, you went on to the, the museum. Yeah, I, that was a tough, that was a strange progression. <laughs> I, a lot of things were, yeah, a strange pivot. I told myself, I'm retiring pivot in 2021. We're going to okay, we'll shift, change, uh, segue, uh, <laughs> segue. Let's say we're going to retire. I was, uh, I had all I ever wanted to do was work for Newsday. Like I said, when I was in college, I thought I was dreaming to work for this newspaper. Just the way that they covered their communities, their style, the people who were there, mm-hmm. they were winning, winning Pulitzers. Not that that mattered much, but still, I wanted to learn from these people. And when I got there, the industry was shifting, and um, there was a lot of things that I liked about it because. I accepted not waiting until my story would print tomorrow. I wanted to print it instantly online. And a lot of reporters didn't want to do that. I was open to that. They could put a camera in my hand and audio equipment. I would record stories. I would do video, video and we would post it on the website. So I was happy about it. I think a shift in me uh, occurred when I just started looking around the industry and really thinking about what's happening with the craft. And um, there were so many outlets that you can go to. So I thought the ones that had a storied commitment to covering news, which was changing a bit to catch up with these new mediums. Mm-hmm. And so I just knew there was not a lot I could contribute anymore. And so in covering the World Trade Center reconstruction mm-hmm. and the Bloomberg administration, which I was surprised, uh, there's been a few exchanges when I was a reporter, I always say this, I'm surprised. I'm like, I wonder why uh, Bloomberg and his team even wanted me to join the organization, but after your cover. Uh, <laughs> but then I think it was genius because okay, that's one problem now in our camp. But um, I, <laughs> of course, I'm kidding. The, the whole press team there at uh, at City Hall, they were wonderful. Stu Lozer was great. Mm-hmm. Still a friend of this day. He actually was at my wedding. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you know, he's the longest serving press secretary in the city's history. Um, and a little fun fact: he, he actually wrote. My recommendation uh, to Joe Daniels, the, the uh, former president of the Nile Memorial Museum. Mm-hmm. Um, but to, to go from journalism to joining the Nile Memorial Museum, um, to me, how I looked at it in my mind is that journalists and museums are similar, right? Mm-hmm. Um, journalists preserve history. They witness history. That's what they do. Museums do the same thing in a way. They preserve history us to learn from so i thought it was a natural progression a natural sorry a natural transition and um what i noticed from afar it was an incredible organization with a committed board uh, a, a great fundraising apparatus but the people in brooklyn didn't even know it was taking shape mm-hmm. so i thought i could really help them uh, hone in on a, a good story and um, that's what i did i'm part of the original uh, leadership team to help open the memorial and then later the now memorial museum yeah, so you've been there, it's been a decade now or more, right? That's right, yeah. that's right. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, Michael, um, the the role of the private sector in the museum uh, in as much as on the caring economy, we talk about that intersection of business and uh, society. What is business's role in society? You've had some amazing corporate sponsors and uh, executives on your board and involved. Um, can you give our, our listeners a sense of the role the private sector plays in the museum? The memorial? You know, I, I think, of course I can, for specifically for our museum, but I think at large for all institutions, uh, private companies, um, you know, they have to understand they have a workforce, they have a board, they have specific interests. Cultural institutions are important. Cultural literacy is important. And I, I think when they can find connections that are aligned with their corporate brand and their values, Mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense for them to support institutions that are a benefit to society, specifically for us. Um, It's been interesting because we're not 
we're unique, Toby. You know, if you, yeah. you, <laughs> if you look at the closer like pretty paintings on the wall or yeah. arts on a stage, not that those don't matter, but it's heavy material you're dealing with. It, it's unique. And, and, and even when you think about walking around some of these storied institutions and you see the names that are associated with an exhibition or mm -hmm. with the collection or a hall. Or a new wing, yep. Or new, you don't see that when you walk around the memorial. You don't see that in the memorial museum. So we're a little different. And what's been so special is the private sector recognizes that. They understand why it's important for them to contribute, particularly American companies. Actually, we, we, we have um, uh, support from around the world, but particularly American co companies because they understand how important that history was. Mm -hmm. And some of them had direct connections. There is a uh, um, president of Pfizer who actually lost employees uh, on the attacks. He was trying to rebuild his business from the ground up when it happened, who is now connected with us and sponsors Summit on Security, this annual event that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so they recognize the importance of it. Another one, um, uh, Richard Edelman, who I've known for some time, was working here before he even joined our organization. Mm -hmm. You know, he has a stake in New York and he's proud of his company. He's also a dedicated board member. Mm -hmm. So I think these companies find these connections that make sense. And for their employees, I think they want to see leadership align certain programs that they are interested in. Yes. Uh, These are a perfect Edelman. example. Yeah, uh, Richard, uh, thank you. Richard Edelman uh, is a friend to both of us. And he, um, you know, his agency does the trust barometer. They just came out with it last, uh, last couple of weeks. And it's specifically focused on the role of business and the in their role in society and the trust that they have or don't have. So it's been actually, if I recall, we should get Richard on the caring economy is if I recall, um, one thing that was that dropped the least or stayed the strongest was trust of companies versus government, right. media and other uh, entities during COVID. Yeah, and museums actually had a high ranking in that trust barometer. And it's been that way, I think, the past previous cycles that he's, he's done it. Um, so one other thing I want to touch on though is not only the private sector for us because we're unique. You know, I'll give you a story. It was a Fox News uh, contributor, I'm sorry, Fox News veteran. His name was Dominic Di Natale. And um, it just shows the relationships that I have with, with people in the media. Mm -hmm. He was actually in Pakistan at the time Osama bin Laden's uh, compound was raided. Mm -hmm. And he freed a couple of bricks from the compound and got them back to America. And through my uh, friendship with a uh, producer at Fox News, we got in contact and he quickly wanted to come to our museum and dedicate this brick that tells the story of the Hump of Bin Laden. So it's these kind of connections that we have, I think are unique than other institutions. It's finding that connective tissue that's really impactful and deep for our organization. Absolutely. Again, ladies and gentlemen, today on The Caring Economy, we have Michael Frazier, who's head of external affairs at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum here in Manhattan. Michael, uh, when you think about this, you, you shared earlier that, uh, you know, raised as a, a Black man in Arkansas, that you first went into the gallery and didn't see people that looked like yourself, or into a newspaper, rather. Um, you are who you are. It's carried you through your whole life. How has that how has that affected your career journey? The good, bad, the ugly? You know, I, I think a lot about this, but in terms of um, um, more about a process of trying to come together mm -hmm. and create something uh, with people from different backgrounds and perspectives, I see that as valuable. I think when you do that, it uh, not only uncovers, but suppresses bias mm -hmm. and you have something better. I think what has been frustrating for me, Toby, to be frank, is I don't think everyone sees that value and can get past it mm -hmm. um, when the mission is greater than you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I work for the 9 11 Memorial Museum. I am not the 9 11 Memorial Museum. So I try to stay in that headspace. Mm -hmm. Throughout my career, there has been microaggressions and there have been microaggressions. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a story and not even have someone's name included in this one, but where I currently work. 
you know, we were talking about an exhibition we wanted to do that related to music, um, different things that we wanted to talk about in advance of the 20th anniversary. And it's a huge meeting. Mm -hmm. I'm not really paying attention to it that much because I'm still trying to figure out in my mind what my communications had on, how would I make a connection of music and 9-11 to a larger public? Yep. So I'm just sort of lost in my thoughts. And they're naming these different uh, musicians that they want to try to recruit for. And I hear someone say, but not hip hop. And I just happen to raise my <laughs> eyes up and saw the person and they're looking at me and I'm going, well, first, I think hip hop is great without it suggesting. <laughs> it's stuff like that. Exactly you why are you looking really at me? Can't, yeah, you can't really, you can't really, you know, let that bother you. I'm saying let, I can't let that bother me, right? Yeah. It's the same thing when I'm so surprised. I, I go to some meetings and people are like, oh, that's a great idea. And I'm not just tossing my title out there to say it. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm the EVP of external affairs. I, I should have a level of confidence. Uh, you should have a level of confidence in me to bring something based on my ability and skill, not how I look. So yeah. I think it's those microaggressions that can really chip at a person. Uh, over time and and that's that's what's been emotionally draining in my career yeah i think michael that's a, a, a also a insightful observation particularly for our younger listeners who are starting their careers because we've uh, as a gay man i've had uh, variations on um, that theme it's what you do with that i think right we of course we have our tough days and we're tired and whatnot but to the degree we can own that and internalize it and make something better something elevating of it the better we have much work to do still, but Michael, have you have you seen any generational shifts uh, since your your coming up in terms of how young people, your mentees, your visitors, uh, maybe even your own kids uh, view race, and is it more empathetic, more evolved, perhaps? What I'm saying are people feel they are now empowered to talk about things more, and I don't know if they feel. They feel physically safe, emotionally safe is a different thing. Mm. And they can talk about these things. The people who I deal with mostly, um, young, aspiring, particularly black men and women who are hoping to get into a pipeline to executive leadership, I'm almost like a war story for them. They are asking specific questions. How do I get where you are mm -hmm. less shrapnel? Like, how, how can I get to a position well, I, you know, where I don't have to go through everything quite like that. Is there? Is, is this the time for me to do that? And and I tell them I wouldn't replace a day. Like you were saying earlier, Toby, we take lessons from those exchanges. So I think it's important. The biggest thing I, you know, for, you know, you mentioned Black Lives Matter. I, I wrote this down because I think it's important. Please. You know, people know these names, right? Lando Castile, July, 2016. Elijah McClain, August, 2019. Ahmaud Arbery, February 2020. George Floyd, May 2020. Now those are just, that's a small timeline. Mm -hmm. Why did it, why did we have to get to George, right? Until there was a swift enough action for people mm -hmm. to start to act like this. So I've been really thinking about um, in my time and talking to pe with people, the anatomy of corporate, and the nation's conscious. Mm -hmm. Like, what, why did it just wake up after that one? I just gave a few examples. They go back for decades. Mm -hmm. um, so I really feel like people need to take this movement, that's what we're calling it, and really seek out people who are doing things that are real, mm -hmm. that can be measured, and not performative. So mm -hmm. I tell all my, I tell everyone that I've ever came across that I, if you want to call me a mentor or I say, if you're involved in something and they're looking for you to bring a diverse perspective, make sure you're not a check for them to place in a box. Mm -hmm. Make sure that your perspective is being um, not only sought after, but taken seriously. Mm -hmm. That you wanna be a catalyst, not a, a as you say, checking of the box. Uh, I think it's not surprising, Michael Frazier, that you are uh, both running external affairs at the 9-11 Museum and Memorial, but also, um, with your training as a journalist, you're using, throughout your career, you have used that drive, that empathy, that, um, that perspective to elevate 
to problem solve, to illustrate, to build consensus where there might not have been before. Um, I do think to your point also, that's where responsible business steps up. It's been my observation that nobody's perfect, no brand is perfect, right. but if they declare where they are on an issue such as Black Lives Matter or climate or COVID or women or fill, fill in the blank, um, and declare that they want to move further along that spectrum to a more caring, more responsible place, then they've got my support because I want to help everyone get to that place, every brand get to that place. That was the gist of my book actually. But um, it, 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 it seems to me that both in your journalism in the past, but now at the museum, you are just by being there and telling that story of that tragic time in the US history that you're, mm -hmm. you're educating and engaging and leaving a better tomorrow. So. Yeah, I have these. You're right, Toby. That you know what? I, I wish more people could just talk about that in the mm -hmm. most natural way. It doesn't have to be about one movement. It should be about the upliftment of all people. And I think it's critically important that we pay attention to what's happening now in our country because it has never been addressed. So I think I don't want to let go of that. But you know, I say something. I say something to my president, and CEO, to my friends, um, just as a communication and marketer. We all need to be acutely aware of who's represented in the decision-making, mm -hmm. in the images we share, the stories we tell, and the products we create, right? So if everyone is aware of what's being shown, consumed, developed, is it representing enough people? Will it reach the right demographic without it being offensive? Like, I think just people need to just be more aware and your humanity will guide you. I promise you, it will. And I think we just have to be forgiving if someone has a misstep and not be quick to label them. There are some people who deserve that label. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying through this process that we're all dealing with, we have to have a little room for forgiveness so we can best move forward. I, I couldn't agree more. I would also add that, Michael, that we need to put the mirror on ourselves and ask what you know, do I have white privilege? I, I do, and what do I do with that? So part of the reason I ask these questions to you and to other guests I've had on the show is I, I want to remain vigilant. I want to be held accountable and I want to try and use my platform to help elevate and keep these important matters top of mind so that change does continue. Um, so I appreciate your letting me sort of go there with you today. What are what are some of the the hidden gems, so to speak, or or what people need to know about the 9-11 Memorial and Museum? I think the hitting gym is people don't know how beautiful it actually is, mm -hmm. even though there was a horrible tragedy there. Mm -hmm. And I also know people don't expect to leave that space inspired. Right. Yes, it's hard to get through emotionally, but you leave inspired. I think that is something that if you've never experienced the museum or not the memorial, you'll be surprised. And that's something you would talk about with your friends or relatives. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. It's, it took me a couple of years to get there when it opened just because of having lived through it here in New York, working at the New York Times, covering it, um, the Times did. It was a lot. But it was, as you say, it's quite uplifting in, in surprising ways. There were, there were sad moments, reflective moments, but important moments. And that is, I think, one of the greatest contributions the museum and memorial make is they help people, grieve is not the word, but perhaps process, synthesize, and come out in a better place. That's the perfect way to put it. There's none, none I can add to that, Toby. Perfect <laughs> synthesization. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again today, we've had Michael Frazier on. He's uh, at formal title is Executive Vice President and Deputy Director of External Affairs at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum here in New York. I just call him my friend and colleague. But Michael, um, I'm going to give you the last word here on the Caring Economy. Any thoughts for, for our audience, either about the, the role of business and society, messages to young people setting out on their career, or those who maybe have been disrupted in their careers because of COVID or other things? And and what lies ahead? Because this is called care in the economy, I'm going to tell people who are either in my position or other ones, uh, care. There are people who you will see on a piece of paper, your resume, who have the ability, right, 
that they have an abundance of ability. The issue is there's a short supply of opportunity. So get past our normal process of the hiring and the talent recruitment, really get to know people, understand what you really want. And I promise you, not only talent will come, diversity will happen naturally. So I ask people to go past the resume and the search firms, do the work, find out what you want, get the talent you need to inspire you and others, and go get them. Great. Michael, um, for our, our listeners, what's the best uh, hashtag or URL for us to tune in, book our trip to New York to visit or to learn more just on your archives and digitally? Sure. So for the Memorial Museum, just visit 911memorial.org. Follow us on Instagram at 911memorial. And uh, also, that's the same handle for Facebook. And so uh, we do a lot of important programming there, and we try to engage people as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So look forward to seeing people, people there. You can actually cut that last part out. <laughs> That's all right. Tell we'll us, be, keep it short. Tell us uh, what's your hashtag or uh, what's your Twitter handle for the museum? At Sept11. That one's a tricky one because it's like we got it last. It's like at SEPT11 Memorial. Uh -huh. so I never give that out. Okay. I always give the uh, Instagram handle. So let me just do the handles one more time. Okay. So I uh, didn't get a hold of it. Rebecca, make a note. We're going to ask the, the socials again. Okay. So five, four, three, twenty. So Michael, for, for uh, both out of town visitors and New Yorkers who want to visit, what's the, what's the best URL or social hashtags to follow and um, Twitter or, or Facebook or Instagram? Sure. Forth? You can find any way to follow us. First, by visit our website at 911memorial.org, which is completely accessible. And also follow us on Instagram at 911memorial. Great. Again, ladies and gentlemen, today it's been my honor to have my friend and colleague, Michael Frazier here. He's the head of external affairs at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. I really encourage you, if you have not, to visit it in person, but in the interim during COVID, definitely check out their website and, and remember those who lost that that we lost that day and um, that there is good to come from that loss. Thank you again, Michael. Thank you, Toby. And folks, subscribe to the Caring Economy. <laughs>